Okay, hi everyone. How's the audio on the video thing? Great. Wow, hi everyone. I'm surrounded by my slides. This is great. Uh, so uh, thanks for coming to this talk, and thanks hugely to Zigo for letting me borrow his laptop while mine crashes on two monitors because it uses the cool new Intel chipset that isn't fully supported. Uh, so uh, I'm here to talk about Sandstorm, and uh, so I'm building Sandstorm with a team of other people, and it's intended to be a viable alternative to software as a service as a whole. Uh, and that's a pretty big goal, to compete with software as a service as a category. And so our first goal is to make something about as easy to use as Google Docs, but much more private. So this talk is both about what Sandstorm is and how packaging works inside Sandstorm, I think that we'll have a bunch of spare time at the end, and then I'll really ask people to what you want me to dig into in more depth. So uh, when Kenton Varda and Jade Wong were initially working on building Sandstorm, they had a few principles they were working from. They noticed that uh, many people are very comfortable using apps that run in web browsers, where Sandstorm is really targeting people who will probably never see a terminal in their lives, and if they will, maybe it'll be for a minute when a friend shows them something. Uh, so Sandstorm is targeting people who are used to using web apps inside web browsers. Uh, we're also, another principle is that people really like choosing the software they use. And this is something that really struck me as, as almost great about Debian, which is that on one hand, there's a huge amount of software available in the Debian archive, and on the other hand, you need to be root to install any of it. And this is a real conflict with the fact that I run a shell server for some friends, and so whenever they want any software, sure, all of our software in Debian is free, but they have to ask me permission to install it. So we'd like to build something where people can install whatever software they want to use safely. Uh, and the other, the other thing that principle the Sandstorm is based on is the idea that security sandboxing is an achievable goal. So uh, I'm going to start this talk with a quick tour of Sandstorm and then talk about a few more things in depth, and I'll conclude with a few comparisons. Yeah, so we'll start with this tour, and uh, I'll show you what Sandstorm looks like to use it. I'll show you uh, what happened in that demo, and then I'll demo how to package some software, which will involve SSHing from this machine to that one. I hope that works OK. And uh, then I'll talk more about the security hardening that Sandstorm does and how the Sandstorm community works, which I think will have some lessons for Debian also. So uh, I said I'd start with a guided tour. Um, there's this service that I and arguably Clint and I think arguably someone else, I think Laura or Hona uh, maintain called storm.debian.net. And uh, storm.debian.net is a Sandstorm install that is for the Debian community to use and I'm going to demo to you what it's like to create a new document there using Etherpad. Uh, actually, how many of you have used Etherpad ever? Okay, cool, quite a few. So you, those of you who have will notice some differences uh, when I do it on Storm. So let me show you that. So this is the dashboard on uh, in Sandstorm, it's showing me a list of things I've already made, but I said I would make something new. So I'll click over here and click over to Etherpad, and then I'll click Create New Pad. And if all goes well, there will be an Etherpad document waiting for us. Waiting for us. So other than the speed, this is like reasonably easy to use. Uh, as a side note, Storm is hosted in the US, so I guess it takes extra long to get all the data back and forth. But anyway, oh, and other than Zigo's script block, uh, other than Zigo's no script, this worked great. Uh, actually, maybe I'll, well, maybe I can communicate with the script blocker. Okay, I'll be careful. Uh, sure, great. <laughs> Great, so now I'll, I'll reload and hope it'll work okay. So there you go, super easy. Hmm. Uh, oh, okay. So 
So supposedly that was pretty easy. I made an Etherpad document. Um, uh, I did have to do it by, by wow, so giant. Um, by clicking this create new pad button here. And so I want to talk a little bit about what that did technically. Um, so when I click that plus button, uh, in Sandstorm it creates a new grain of the app. And uh, everything you create in Sandstorm, a document or an email box or uh, a chat system is a grain. Um, and now I've used this term without defining it. So I'll be really concrete. When you have a, when, you, when I click that plus button, on the server, it launched a new process for Etherpad. Etherpad is written in Node.js, so there's now a new Node.js process running on the server side. Uh, that process runs in a context where it can only see the code in the Sandstorm package for Etherpad, uh, and that's mounted read-only. And then unique to every grain is a writable slash var directory, and also a disposable slash temp that gets cleared whenever stuff exits. Uh, and so the Etherpad code wakes up in this world where the only place it can write to is slash var, and it notices it's empty, so it goes and makes a new database in slash var, and it makes a single document there, and then it starts responding to HTTP requests. And so each time I click plus, it's in, in effect a new Etherpad install uh, that happens to support that new document. Um, and I mentioned HTTP requests. All the HTTP requests between the, between this, this browser window and this grain here uh, are mediated by Sandstorm. They don't actually go straight to the app. So uh, by putting Sandstorm in the middle, it means that Sandstorm can do access control uh, for the app. And just to demonstrate that, I'm going to go back to this Etherpad tab here. I uh, guess you can't see the URL, so maybe I'll change that. Um, so the URL is like stormdebian.net slash grain slash something or other. And if I open that in a private browsing window, uh, which I'll move over to your screen now, if I open that in a private browsing window, Sandstorm will tell me, you did not have permission to access this grain, please sign in to request access. <coughs> so this is really highlighting the fact that Sandstorm sits in the middle of all the HTTP conversations between the user and the app. Uh, And uh, so this, this allows us to do something interesting in Sandstorm. It means that when the app receives any HTTP request at all, it can know that HTTP request has already been access checked. So uh, Sandstorm can add a couple of headers to that request indicating what permissions the user has. And so this is a couple of those headers. Uh, Sandstorm sends its name, my name over, and it sends over the list of permissions that I have. Uh, and then any other headers that the browser sends to the server. Um, so that's sort of the, the very broad overview of how HTTP requests work and what it means to make a grain. Um, I talked about access control, so let me zoom in a little bit on that. Uh, so, and to do that, I'll do another demo. Uh, and I'm gonna use my other laptop. Is, there, is anyone here willing to participate in a demo using your own laptop and on the Menzies-12 IRC channel? Okay, great, somebody in the back. So, uh, I'm going to share that pad with you. It's not important that I'm using my other machine, it's just that I'm more comfortable with it. Uh, actually, it's probably better if I demo it here. Yeah, sure, okay, so if I click share access here, I can make a shareable link that has edit permissions, which for my convenience, I'll do for my laptop here. And it's devconf 16 menzies 12 is that right? Great. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, so there's at least two people who volunteered in IRC to, uh, to watch that. Pardon me while all my demo stuff breaks. 
OK, so uh, I'm going to reload this document. You all should write things to make my demo be more interesting. Yay, hello. Uh, great. So, um, so actually, do me a favor and just like hold down a key, like A or Enter or something. Uh, great. Uh, I'm going to revoke your access now. Thanks. Uh, bye. OK, so now you can't write anything more. Um, and do you, do you agree? Are you able to write anything more? Um, yeah, so the, um, the, the point here is that Sandstorm on the outside gives me the ability to set permissions on the sharing links and the people I've shared with, uh, which are now all revoked, um, via this consistent interface outside the app. Um, and so what that the, the two concepts we, we really saw there are the two concepts we really saw are sharing links and the idea that permission headers can change. So uh, his ability to access that app really is mediated by Sandstorm. So that's sort of what it's like to use Sandstorm. Uh, I'm going to talk now about packaging. Maybe before I do, do you have any questions so far about what you've seen? OK, great. Um, so in Sandstorm, uh, there's a, we have, Sandstorm has a concept of the SPK file, which is a binary package. It's a list of files and some metadata. It's pretty similar to a .deb binary package in that it is a list of files and their contents and some metadata. Um, so in our case, the metadata lives in a uh, configuration thing called Sandstorm package def .cap and p. Um, there is one dis distinction between binary SPKs and binary DEBs, which is that binary SPKs are always signed, and they're signed using an app key that is the app ID. So whoever holds the app key can issue updates for that package, and uh, if you don't have, if you lose that app key, you're kind of screwed. Uh, uh, although we have actually like whitelisted a couple of key transitions in the Sandstorm core for people who have already lost their uh, lost their keys and trusted us to replace them. Uh, and um, yeah, and so, so this is different from a dev, of course, where the signatures are done at the archive level, not at the dev level. Um, so to make a Sandstorm package file, the, the most raw way to do it is to uh, take this Sandstorm package def cap and p and pass it to the SPK pack command. And that will generate you one of these SPK files based on the list of files referred to by Sandstorm package def cap and p and the, and the metadata inside the package. Uh, if you do it that way, it'll definitely work, but it'll slurp up whatever files of that file name exist on your system, which may or may not be what you want. Maybe if you're tr collaborating with somebody else on a package, the path to something is different on theirs than on yours. Uh, so uh, also, to do it this way, involves no concept of source packages at all. This is how things were until a year and a half ago when I started at Sandstorm. And Drew Fisher and I worked together to make a concept of source packages using this tool, Vagrant SPK, uh, which I will now, should I, should I risk the demo? Let's see. Uh, you don't need to set or you do? That's fine. I'll just take it into my machine. Great. Uh, so. Before I do the demo, I guess let me just talk about the, the concepts of what it is to make a Sandstorm package with a Vagrant SPK. You first declare what, what sort of platform stack a web app uses, be that a PHP-based thing like LEMP, Linux, Nginx, MySQL PHP, uh, or Python stuff, or Meteor, or Node.js, and there's a few other ones. Some of these are contributed by the community, some of these are maintained by us, the Sandstorm core team. So you define, you declare what platform stack the package uses, uh, you make a new entire Linux virtual machine 
that you will run the web app inside. Uh, and the configuration files for the virtual machine are set up in the setup VM phase. So VM up will start that virtual machine. Uh, Vagrant SDK in it will make the sandstorm package dev file that contains the name of the package and uh, and uh, I guess, and it'll also assign the app a unique key that will be its update key forever. Uh, and then you can run the app by, in a development view of Sandstorm where you can modify the app code and it's not fixed yet uh, and click around. And during this process, we actually trace the app to find out what files it uses. Because we have this, this problem where on one hand, we want the app to bundle all of its dependencies, but on the other hand, we don't want every app package to be two gigabytes. So uh, when the app is running in this dev mode, it, uh, we've mounted a fuse file system overlay on top of the file system, and any file access that the app makes, we've leave, we leave a note to ourselves to add that file to the sandstorm files.list, which has this upside of small packages and this downside of if you didn't click on the right part of the UI to import the right Python module, you might never get it. And then when your users do, it'll break. Uh, so there is a provision for whitelisting directories to include certain whole directories at the packager's request. Uh, and then you run pack, and that makes a sandstorm package file. So maybe I'll, I'll risk the demogods after I'm done with the slides. Uh, and I'll, um, maybe I'll just ask you if you have any questions about this process, if I, there's any steps I should zoom in on. Yeah. Oh, and if the question is, how do you handle GPL? Well, let me get to that later. No, it's just about the platform stack. Uh, you mentioned a list of samples. Do you have Ruby on Rails support uh, in, among the list? Uh, no, but we almost do. We have like a wiki page that says how you would do it, but there isn't a pre-made one. And there's one more in the back. Oh, you know, one thing I forgot to mention is that uh, the setup VM, in the VM up step, so the setup VM step will, and I'll get to your question in just a second. Uh, the setup VM step will write a bunch of shell scripts out that are the platform stack. And those shell scripts do things like sudo apt get install, the things that your app will probably need based on what we think based on the platform stack name. Um, so um, anyway, that's Debian. Ben, yeah. Uh, so I was con con kind of concerned about the way you discover what files need to be bundled. Why uh, would that possibly be concerning? <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? I mean, I'm kidding. Does the does that list get saved so that you can then reproduce this build using the the next time? Yeah. Do can you script that stage so that uh, you have? Um, you have some sort of uh, scripts to exercise whatever parts of the app, hopefully all parts of the app, and then to, to generate that list. So for so the first question, the, the, the list does get saved. Uh, there's a, it outputs a file, sandstorm-files.list, which you're supposed to get add into your package. It's really, conceptually, I consider it part of the source package. And um, right. as for scripting it, there's, there's no, there's no, especially sandstormy way to script it, but you could if you tried hard. How's that for a no? <laughs> um, uh, there are a few platform stacks where the exercising stuff doesn't matter at all. I think there's just one actually, which is Meteor. Meteor, ha Meteor is this Node.js based web framework and it has this feature that it can output a list of all the files the app needs because it controls the entire environment of the app. Um, so, so that one, we won't break it. As for every other app, we probably won't. Uh, there's certainly been like app point releases people have issued that are them forgetting to include certain files because they didn't exercise them. And uh, in addition to the auto-generated Sandstorm files list, you can add things to an always include line in the Sandstorm package def, which will make sure it's always included whether or not it's in the files list. Uh, and there was a f sorry. There was a final t yeah. technical question w uh, about, about bundling, which was, I was a bit surprised that you would use Fuse as a layer there, um, and I thought FA Notify might be more efficient. But I think if it was, works, it works. 
Yeah, I think there was some race condition problem with FI Notify, but I'm forgetting. One more question over here. Uh, my question relates to updates. Um, great, you've got your Sandstorm platform and you've chosen some apps. How, how, when, when the packages release an updated version of Etherpad, or how, how does that come down to my Sandstorm server? How, right. do, I, how do I get that? Great. Um, uh, I'll just answer that now, I think. Um, so so short answer is um, there's, this, there's this service that Sandstorm, the company runs called apps.sandstorm.io, and there's an, a big one SPK command called upload, which uploads the more recent version of your SPK file to that. Um, and every Sandstorm server checks a JSON dump from that apps.sandstorm.io daily. And if there is a new update to any app you have installed, then it shows you a notification in a bell icon that when you click that, it shows you which apps have updates. Then you click the install updates button, and then you have the update. And uh, Code-wise, this is technically easy because the app runs in a file system namespace where the only, code, where the only uh, files it can perceive are the app code itself. So there's no dependency problem to work out with it. On that note, does that, what happens to running grains that are, right. when an update is installed, does it, do you have to reinitialize them or, or what happens to those? I mean, in general, if the grain already exists, I mean, uh, there's two different answers, maybe, depending on what you mean. Uh, if, if you mean, if you have like this thing that I made over here, uh, uh, if I were to install an Etherpad update, then the processes for this Etherpad grain would get stopped. Um, the code for the new version of Etherpad would start, it would read the data out of slash var, and so it would continue to provide the same interface, but there would be a quick flip. And uh, as for, if that would apply to grains that I literally have open right now, I actually don't know off the top of my head. But certainly when the grain shuts down, it would wake up with the new code. Thank you. Uh, so so I'll, I'll avoid risking, risking harming the demigods again right now, and I'll just continue past this. Uh, one, th one thing I want to point out is that every Sandstorm package is a Debian-derived distro. Uh, Etherpad on Sandstorm is a Debian-derived distro. Uh, all the other 57 apps are, I think, except for the ones that chose to base their, to bundle files from not Debian, in which case they bundled it from some other Linux distro. Uh, so exactly what relationship they should have to Debian isn't quite clear. Uh, also, these packages are kind of enjoyably small. The Etherpad package is 18 megabytes. So that might be the smallest useful Debian I don't know, are, are there smaller, useful Debian-derived distros people know of? Uh, so I think, I think, I think that's kind of cool. Um, what did you say? <laughs> yes, in it ran at first. <laughs> and I'm cheating with the 18 megabyte number because it's compressed. I think it was LVMA, so it's like mega compressed. So you probably have like 60 megs of headroom. But, uh, but another th fascinating thing is that people really do use this Vagrant SPK tool on Mac OS and Windows, not just on Linux systems. Um, which, uh, which, if I'm to, to speak about Debian for a second, um, there's this program called FPM. I think it's called Effing Package Management. And uh, it exists to take like directories of files and jam them into whatever packaging format you wish. Uh, and as far as I can tell, it exists because the, it exists because people aren't very familiar with the Debian packaging tools. Um, and in part, they're not very familiar with the Debian packaging tools because they don't run Debian. They run Mac OS or Windows. Uh, so, it, and we, it's, I think it's pretty cool that we can have all these people on different platforms making sense from apps. Uh, another thing, though, is that some porting of the app can be required. So apps need their login pages removed because when the user shows up to a, a grain in Sandstorm, they're already logged in. Um, and in Etherpad, uh, something needed to be done so that it would only ever create one pad per grain. Um, so uh, it's, not, it's not the case that you can take any random off the shelf bit of web app and do this weird tracing thing and put it into a bundle and run it successfully. Uh, you might need to make some changes relevant to Sandstorm. 
Oh yeah, and you might need to look at those headers, like I mentioned, the X stands for username. So uh, I guess, is Antonio Tercero at DevConf this year, by the way? Anyway, I want to say thanks to him for packaging Vagrant in Debian. Uh, I use it all the time from his packages. So um, with those packaging steps talked about briefly, I want to talk about the Sandstorm backend and security. Uh, we have this very strange seeming goal that users can run arbitrary code safely. And like nowadays, the phrase arbitrary code sounds like a security issue. Like, oh no, arbitrary code execution. But when I run a shell server for my friends and it runs Debian, the whole point is arbitrary code execution. So the, the idea that we have this crazy size seeming goal shouldn't be that crazy, I think, by comparison. Here's the translation of that idea into a web app space. And uh, to do that, though, we do need to make sure this arbitrary code can be run safely. So we do a bunch of server-side sandboxing things in the grain. Uh, to start with, I mentioned this file system sandbox, uh, sorry, the file system namespaces where only the code inside the app package is available plus var and temp. Uh, we use PID namespaces in Linux uh, so that if somebody in the grain runs like PS, they would only see stuff inside the grain. Uh, we use this UTS namespaces thing so that the grain always runs in an environment where its host name is like, I think, sandbox host name. Uh, and then there's a system five RPC thing, which I actually don't think matters for us, but we do it. Uh, anyway, we do some more extreme things. First of all, there's no slash dev and no slash proc inside the grain, uh, which is kind of cruel, but it has the upside that kernel vulnerability is that leverage proc or dev can't be exploited. Well, there's nothing exciting in dev. You can make node whatever you want, Actually, you might not be call, able to call make node unless you UID zero, so I guess you can't make node whatever you want. Okay, great. So it's good that we don't allow access to slash dev. Uh, if we have a static slash dev with a, uh, yeah, with like dev null and dev random, which is a sim link to dev u random and dev u random, which is the real thing. Uh, uh, yeah, we have a proc CPU info, which is hard coded uh, from the app packagers machine which is not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I need to... Oh yeah, if we can get better microphones, that'd be great. And let me, let me just double check that, actually. Oh no, I take it back. We do map in the real proxy PU. Okay, now. right. I just read the source, yeah. Uh, yeah, otherwise you'd have illegal instructions all over the place if you were unlucky. Um, yeah, we also don't have any real network devices. We just have one loopback device inside the, name, inside the network namespace for the app, and we use user namespaces, so they, there's only UID 1000 inside the grain sandbox. Also, we use a kernel feature called no new pribs, so that even if there were somehow a set UID process inside the sandbox, executing it would not result in a UID zero running program. Um, and we use setcom BPF to limit what syscalls, what kernel syscalls that the app can do. So um, there's things like uh, access to 32-bit instruction, 32-bit syscalls for 32-bit binaries running on an x86-64 machine, which we block. Uh, we also block a whole bunch of irrelevant network types and so on. Uh, I, I have these under the extreme section just because until I'd heard of Sandstorm, I'd never heard of anyone doing all these things. Uh, and the other one, which I know that no one else does, is that, so uh, with all this said, uh, it seems like there's no way to actually get HTTP in and out of the grain. There's just LO. Um, so to solve that problem, we have uh, a single Unix socket that is passed in by file descriptor into the grain, over which all communication occurs using a library that we maintain called Catherine Proto, which is also in Debian. Uh, it's just yet another binary RPC system. I can say things that are cool about it, but that's all that's important for now. Um, so the only way in and out of the grain is over this one file descriptor of a Unix socket. Uh, and so that's the sandboxing. Uh, Scalability-wise, I think Mad Duck asked me earlier today, if you make a new Etherpad process and install for each Etherpad document, how can this possibly work? Uh, and to answer that, you should first think about Android. So on Android, when there's memory pressure on my phone, uh, the operating system, the platform is willing to kill processes belonging to apps that are using up a lot of memory. It hopes that those processes save all their state to wherever they're allowed to save state, so that when you go visit that app again, uh, 
it loads up just the same way, with just the same screen open. And so we do the same thing. After 15 minutes of non-use, uh, we, we kill the processes inside the grain, and then if I go visit that grain again, it'll spin for a second and then come back. Uh, other scalability thing is that Sandstorm is single server only um, to make all this work. So uh, we do have this crazy goal that I said, which is to let users run arbitrary code safely. Uh, and that gets really interesting in a context where people do share things with other people. Um, the attackers, like on the web, it could easily be the case that external attackers could successfully break into one of these grains. And so where we've sort of drawn that line is that attackers should only, should only be able to exploit vulnerabilities in grains to which they already have access. So you know, now that I revoked the sharing link I made before, there's no way for anyone except me to make any HTTP requests into that Etherpad grain. So even if that Etherpad grain had an old version of libssl, even if it had a remote code execution bug, if it had this or that, you can't reach it, so you can't exploit it unless you've already been granted access. And so I want to talk a bit about the security issues we've defanged this way. Uh, we did a bit of a study last year to see which, uh, which documented vulnerabilities in web apps that are packaged for Sandstorm uh, were still an issue inside Sandstorm. So we had this guess that we would defang a lot of them. And we found that over 95% of them we had mitigated uh, usually entirely. And uh, to illuminate this, let me, let me give you two brief summaries. First of all, a single document service is much easier to secure. So to go over these, uh, on Etherpad, there's a variety of issues that say that if you have access to Etherpad server, you can list all the documents on that server. Etherpad has no built-in access control. The document ID is the access control. So once you have the document ID, you can go read it. Well, that doesn't help if each Etherpad grain is just one document inside. Uh, so none of those apply. Uh, in Sherla Tech, there's a bug where an attacker could read an arbitrary file on the server, uh, but in shell attack on Sandstorm, the only files on the server are the shell attack package, which is public knowledge, and the files in slash var if you have access to this grain. So that doesn't elevate your privileges. If you could view the grain, you can view the grain. Uh, also, you could run arbitrary shell commands on some versions of shell attack, but you can only exploit that if you've been ac ac given access to the grain, so that doesn't help you as an attacker. And then this tiny, tiny RSS bug where you could do SQL injections and nobody even got a CVE for it. Uh, anyway, in tiny, tiny RSS, each user's install of tiny, tiny RSS is sandboxed from each other users. So if you can access your own tiny, tiny RSS, it's not interesting that you can also SQL inject it because you can go click around in the UI and modify stuff yourself without that. So those are the app vulnerabilities, some of them, that we've managed to defend against. Uh, and all of these we defended against before they were disclosed, of course, because it's just a design. Based on the Sandstorm design, the security just falls out as a result. Uh, and similarly, a limited kernel is easier to defend. So I think that we blocked some, at least 75%, at least and it might be more than that, of the Linux kernel CVEs in the past uh, year and a half that we looked at this. Um, we don't allow unprivileged user namespaces inside the grain, so they, nobody can exploit those bugs. Uh, you can't use set UD binaries on Sandstorms, so you can't exploit those bugs. And there's a whole bunch of kernel bugs in all these obscure features of the kernel in syscalls that we block, so you can't exploit those either. I think, yeah, uh, there are two that did apply on Sandstorm, and you can look at our docs, or I can show it to you afterwards, or in a second if you want, uh, to see what those were. Um, but this stuff is important to me, not just because I love putting CVE numbers on slides. It's important to me because uh, in 2004, I was running a wiki for myself and some friends, and I, uh, uh, I neglected to update it because I didn't pay attention to the Twiki security announcements mailing list in, I think it was March 2004. And then in May 2004, I noticed there were a whole bunch of weird Perl processes on my system. And it turned out that somebody had exploited a, a bug where the search functionality inside Twiki, if you added a backtick and a semicolon in the right place, you could run whatever code you want on the server because it just execs grep. Uh, and I didn't audit that code. And no one could realistic, realistically expect me to audit that code when I was running it on my server. So uh, things like this prevent people from self-hosting their own apps. And if the competition is software as a service, 
then the competition is teams that have a dedicated security team. So if Sandstorm or something like it can protect users in a way comparable to what a multi-million dollar security team does on their side through a lot of effort, on our side through bizarre sandboxing, <laughs> then, uh, then you can get something comparable where self-hosting is actually a good idea. Otherwise, running your own web apps is a giant slog that everyone in the long run will stop doing. Or alternatively, only people who have well-funded maintenance teams will do. And that's not really a future that's exciting to me either. Uh, so, uh, so with that said, I want to talk more about community. Um, one of the things that is fascinating to me about Sandstorm is that we do uh, really want upstreams to maintain their packages in Sandstorm. Uh, and and there's, there's, I think, about five or so out of the 58 Sandstorm packages that exist that are Sandstorm only, or at least Sandstorm first. Um, so those are apps that if you ran them without Sandstorm, they wouldn't work. And, or at least they would show a UI, but some functionality wouldn't work. And people seem to like the idea of making Sandstorm first apps because they don't need to build a login button. The user is already logged in. They don't need to build a multi-document UI. The Sandstorm new grains button handles that. Uh, and there's also this clear separation of concerns in the platform where if you bundle whatever you want, if you bundle Mongo, if you bundle Redis, if you bundle a version of Node that's not in the Debian archive, just have a lot of fun. Whatever you're doing is not negatively impacting any other apps. So there's no platform reason to stop you. So, uh, so we just say, yeah, whatever, go ahead, do whatever you want inside the sandbox. And web app upstreams, as you likely can guess, find that pretty exciting. There's also no deployment process, really, for installing a Sandstorm app. There's just that, like, plus button. There's an install process that I can show you, but it's really just, like, click, click. Uh, similarly, it doesn't require any thinking. All of the effort in the deployment process is done once in the packaging time. So, yeah, so the result is that we actually have a lot of packages maintained by upstreams, uh, and a handful of them are Sandstorm only. So, uh, in terms of lessons for Debian, there's a few things to think about. Um, at Sandstorm, we have this goal that we think that, that web app authors will want to publicize Sandstorm as a good way to run their own software. Uh, and that actually leads me to this general question about Debian. Like, how, what is our model for how people discover Debian and choose to run it? Uh, I think our model is basically tech press plus their friends, uh, some, some, some union of those. And, it would be interesting and if, if app authors uh, were also part of that equation, really. Um, is, can anyone, is there an app that people are like, I guess maybe Apache, maybe the Apache docs are like, you should install Debian so you can have Apache, but nearly nothing else I can think of really recommends Debian from the upstream's perspective. Uh, and certainly web app packages don't, I have to say. Um, and then there's this other, question. So for us, uh, we, we don't really have anything resembling Debian policy. We just have the technical facts of how the sandbox works, and we tell app authors to do, do whatever they want. And uh, on the other hand, Debian has policy, and it's actually really powerful. Uh, I think, though, that Debian policy's main contribution is preventing Debian developers like us from stepping on each other's toes. Um, and then if that's the case, I wonder to what extent you know, we can evolve out, hypothetically, make sure that policy is as minimal as possible to make sure that is, we have to step on each other's toes as little as possible. Also, Debian policy doesn't help my friend Chris, who has an account on my Debian shell server, who wants to apt-get install something, but still needs my permission to. So there's still something I think we can do to make Debian policy help end users more than it does now. It certainly helps sysadmins a lot, though. Uh, and then along those lines, uh, Right now, there's an effort in GNOME to make a new app packaging thing, XDG app. There's, <laughs> I can see some reactions. Um, there's the canonical snappy thing. And each of these are at least slightly interesting because they have some, some story about sandboxing. Because to the extent that app packages, when you install them now in a Debian system, need to work together to avoid trampling the whole system, if they didn't need to work together because they were sandboxed somewhere unique to the app, then maybe we could have less policy or maybe we could recommend people install apps via a different way than devs. Uh, and the other thing is that 
Sandstorm has this sort of different software freedom focus, which is we are, we do really care about software freedom. It's just that the, our, our priority is making sure that people can run the software they want uh, without having to ask permission from anyone, which is a different, weirder kind of software freedom than DFSG, although we do care about DFSG also. Uh, and uh, I know that we have just a minute left before 2.45, so I'll just leave this line here and say one sentence. Um, we run these centralized services like I do Mentors Debian Net for package review. And because I'm one of maybe three maintainers of Mentors at Debian.net along with OLAF D and PABS, uh, anyone who wants any changes in that service has to go through me. And I think that that is not a great vision of software freedom. And it's why the thing stagnated over the past five years, I think. Uh, so, uh, just after this, there's a boss, and uh, there's maybe some time for Q&A here, and I have some stickers that I'll grab from my backpack now. Thanks so much for listening. Oh, and I have one other line to say, actually, which is, uh, if anyone ever asks you what Sandstorm is, because I've just told you so many things that are true about it, uh, it's taken me about a year and a half to come up with this summary. So I've saved you the work. You can tell them Sandstorm is a more private Google Doc. More yeah. Well, we don't have the whole global CDN thing going for us. Uh, but we do have some plans to integrate with CDNs eventually, optionally. Yeah. Oh, and thanks, Zigo, again for your laptop. Goodness. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, I guess it's your power. I was I was actually a little skeptical when I heard your this is a Google Doc thing, but I actually think it's awesome. It's really great for anyone who wants to run a web app without lying and lying awake at night worrying about whether they. I mean, that's great. I, I really like it. So. Thanks. Great. Yeah, I mean, one of the other things about the scalability thing is that web apps usually have scaling problems because a lot of people are accessing them. And if a lot of people, uh, not very many people are going to be accessing a thing that is access controlled so that only you and your friends can view it. So the scaling problems actually aren't a huge deal, we find. Well, we have one more question here if we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The possible solution, uh, or similar at least. And uh, I wonder if you have plans to uh, go further than just what you do, because uh, Flatpak is clearly desktop oriented, and but with good integration with uh, free desktop menu, so the application show. But well, a web application is an, an application like another, just using another technology. Yeah. I would want to see it on my menu as well. So is there some? Uh, integration here that could be done. I don't know if it's at the mid level or the sandstorm uh, level, but uh, it's clearly something that it needed. Yeah, that would be interesting. Uh, <coughs> that's a really good idea, and I haven't thought enough about it to think about what I should say. <laughs> okay, then another question for you <laughs> if you want. <laughs> uh, is there ways to plug more holes in the sandbox so for example you can uh, uh, run the database outside of the of the grain and uh, store it uh, on the uh, main machine yeah so yes and no um i should say no and yes um the database one well the ways that we want sandbox holes to get to show up is where uh you know so i showed you the sharing menu where you can share access to other people there will be a way for the app to request access to either another different grain or some external service entirely, like your Twitter account or something. And that would also be, uh, be mediated by the same Sandstorm UI. You'd get a top drop down that would say, do you want this, to access, do you want this thing to be able to access your Twitter or something like that? Uh, and we're still working on the details of that. You could, so, so that's how we expect holes being poked in the sandbox to work. Um, it's kind of sad to me if in order to start an app at all, you need to poke a hole in the sandbox first because then the user has no concept of why it's worth doing. And so I wouldn't want it to be true that an app depends on some external service 
to work for a database. But on the other hand, you can imagine some like, like PHP and my admin. The whole point of PHP and my, usually the point of PHP and my admin is, can be anyway, to connect to a remote database. And so in that case, it would make sense for it to show a chooser to let you choose a remote database. We have maybe another question. Uh, it's also worth saying there is there's a buff after this here, so if you have more questions, then I will just stick around. But I'm happy to answer them here too. Okay. So you mentioned that basically your Sandstorm package is built by running this process, by installing the entire thing in a VM and extracting all the files, which means that unlike a source package, you don't really know how to reproduce the build. And like what happens, for instance, if there is a Debian security update, and how, how do I know that my package need to be updated or rebuilt? And how do, yeah, basically, how do we, or can we help that happen more or less automatically? Well, the, um, so first I'm gonna tell you something that won't thrill you, which is solving that problem is not a real focus for the Sandstorm core team in the next year or two, because we want the sandboxing to be good enough that even if the app is vulnerable, it's not a big deal. Now, having said that, if you have a WordPress blog and you only give other people like edit access that they can exploit an image magic bug to an arbitrary code, elevate their privileges, that might be bad, so it might still be worth fixing. It is not as big of a deal. So uh, what I would, l the, the thing that comes to mind is to use the file contents, the file hashes. So what I would like to see is something that uh, analyzes Sandstorm packages to see if they contain files whose hashes are known to be superseded by Debian security update version. And from our end, we are, the, the packaging tooling that I co-maintain with Drew Fisher, uh, that thing targets Debian Jesse stable for the reason that we want it to be easy to let these point releases just happen. Okay, great, thanks, bye. I'll be right here. Oh, and 